Ten years ago this Saturday, torrential rains caused this city to flood. It left homeowners and the city scrambling to clean up the damage. And it changed the way the city manages stormwater. In a moment, we will hear about the lessons learned from someone who analyzes losses from extreme weather. But first, from Metro Mornings Archives, here is plumber Michael Yaffa speaking to Matt Galloway the morning after the storm. I, I was driving home and I saw that, that cloud. It was black. Like it was, I knew something bad was going to happen. Tell us a little bit about how that's looked. I mean, what, when did people start to call you and what were they calling about? Uh, the night before last, it started around, um, I believe, around 6 o'clock or so, and it didn't stop till about 9 at night. It tapered off, and then it started again the next morning. Went our neighbors to both sides and across the street and up and down my street are just have been under a lot of water, with anywhere from 3 inches up to a foot of sewage water. And some of that as well in a newly renovated basement? Correct. Why people would spend, you know, fifty or $80,000 on a on a basement reno and not spend a couple hundred dollars to have a, 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 a drain line scope to make sure that, you know, the drains are good or you install a backwater valve and all, there's all kinds of sort of preventative uh, things that people could do, which I'm going to be doing a backwater valve myself in the next week. I don't want to have this again. Explain what that is for people who don't know. It's a, basically a, a valve or a, a device that goes on the sewer itself just below the floor and it's like a gate and it, it remains open and then it, if it senses any water coming back, it lifts it up like a spoiler or a wing on an airplane. It lifts up and locks and prevents any water from backing into the house. For people, if you're talking about uh, inches of, of sewage water uh, in someone's basement, when you show up there, what are you doing? Well, I spent uh, the other night um, going up and down the street helping people bail and sweep water and showing them what to do and looking at their sump pumps and that, um, going up and down and helping everybody. I couldn't even get off my street. <laughs> so. what, what has that meant in terms of damage? Mostly people put a lot of valuable things, you know, in the basements, like photographs and, and books. And and uh, sometimes you see electronics that sit very low down on the floor, like, you know, for the big home theater setups and that. And a lot of damage, you know. It's it's very sad, you know. It's, it shouldn't be like that. Mm. I was at a customer's house yesterday. His brother-in-law lived in Hong Kong for about three years. And his brother-in-law said what we got the other night was was like a drizzle in for Hong Kong. <laughs> They're able to handle, they have the infrastructure to handle the monsoons and the typhoons and all that kind of stuff. We don't have that here. Uh, our systems are so antiquated, I think, and the city has outgrown and outstripped the capability to support all the, all the development that's happened in the city. From July of 2013, that was plumber Michael Yaffa talking to Matt Galloway the day after the storm that shut this city down. My next guest was also hard at work the next morning to take the measure of the storm. Glenn McGilvery is managing director of the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. It was created to look at what municipalities can do to anticipate and adapt to national natural disasters. Good morning, Glenn. Good morning. We just heard the plumber talk about how dark the sky was on that day when this flood happened. What do you remember about the evening of that flood? Um, I had gotten home uh, from working downtown and started getting an inkling that there was a major event uh, unfolding in in Toronto. I called a friend of mine to tell him about it because he's also uh, in the reinsurance business and he wasn't home. He was actually uh, at an event in Toronto and I said to his wife, there's a major disaster unfolding in in Toronto, and little did we know it was a billion-dollar event. Let's talk a little bit more about that. We we heard from from the plumber Michael Yaffa in that interview. There, uh, the Toronto was simply not equipped to deal with the stormwater that day. Did the city, you know, change the way it manages stormwater because of what we saw on that day in 2013? I think it largely has, and and it, it might have been kind of on the way to making some changes, but certainly 2013. Uh, changed a lot of minds and changed a lot of policies uh, on the on the Toronto side. Um, I have to say that a lot of cities wouldn't be able to handle this kind of water. When you get that much rain in a very slow moving storm, and that that was really key here. Um, you know, if if that storm had a had a just passed through really quickly, we wouldn't have had all of this. But it was a very slow moving storm, and and that was uh, you know. Uh, cause for a lot of the damage. Yeah, certainly in the volume of, of water and, and, and the timing obviously factored into that. But can you tell us a bit more about what, what did sort of change? What were some of the new priorities that were set after this, this event happened? Sure. So Toronto used to do what we called storm chasing. So you, they would get an event. So you take the, um, there was a, a big flood in, in Toronto in 2005. 
Um, so they would kind of have a knee-jerk reaction and uh, focus on the areas that were hit by that storm and start doing the environmental assessments and other uh, analyses that take uh, up to two years or more, uh, preparing to do some engineering work to prevent that sort of thing from happening again. And then halfway through that sort of thing, they would get another event. I think there was one in 2008, if I'm not mistaken. Then they would switch focus and start working on on doing the same thing for that storm mm. and they would get kind of distracted and so what they finally did uh particularly after 2013 was they stopped chasing storms and stopped this kind of knee-jerk reaction what they did was they designated the entire city as a risk zone and started to do work to analyze you know and prioritize projects and figure out well if the whole city's at risk what do we have to do first so what, what can we do second what can wait a little bit farther down the line so it was less of a knee-jerk reaction and more of a kind of a systems approach, looking at the whole city as a whole. Mm-hmm. I wanted to talk about sort of different measures that that you know individual homeowners, um, you know, have you know can get, I suppose, to to uh, you know deal with some of the aftermath of these events. We heard that plumber mention these things called backwater valves. He kind of explained them as these valves that sort of um, you know act like a gate. They sense water and lift and and prevent water from coming back the other way. Do most homeowners have backwater valves now? No, absolutely not. Um, uh, they're very effective devices uh, if they're put in properly. Uh, there are some cir- circumstances I don't want to get into. It's technical, but there are some circumstances where you can actually make a problem worse. But for the mo- most part, they're very effective. Eight out of 10 provinces require them in new builds. Um, British Columbia and Ontario do not. Hmm. And so... Um, what has happened is many cities like Toronto have ma- have mandated them in new construction. Um, the trick is, what do we do about existing homes and retrofit? You know, how do we retrofit those in? So, you know, part of the big change that Toronto has made over the years is they've launched the Basement Flooding Protection Program. Uh, it's kind of a three prong program, but one of the prongs is uh, working with homeowners to help them install these devices by giving them some some money. So Toronto will uh, help you pay for up to. Uh, Twelve hundred fifty dollars for the installation of a backwater valve, so, and they'll help so, pay for some other things as well. Yeah, certainly that would be an impetus, you think, to to install these. Particularly, they do help in these types of in these types of incidents. Uh, I wanted to, to sort of go back to you know you mentioned that a lot of cities wouldn't have been prepared to to deal with what we dealt with on that day in twenty thirteen. We heard in the clip though from uh, you know uh, the plumber about you know Hong Kong has has the infrastructure to sort of manage monsoons and things like that. Do we need to be sort of changing the way we adapt symptoms or systems more broadly across the city to to anticipate larger storms, particularly with climate change and what we're seeing in terms of extreme weather? Yeah, I think um, that work is being done. Uh, we certainly aren't going to build for a monsoon. And that's always the question, you know, uh, what event do you build for? How far uh, uh, do you go? Do you build for the extremely rare events that may never come or may only come once or twice? That's always the question in disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation is how far do you go? How much do you invest? Uh, but through that basement flooding protection program I told you about, another prong of that program is large capital projects to help manage a heavy rainfall. And these projects can include things like, uh, you know, um, storm sewer tunnels. Um, uh, one of the things the city's done is they put in a whole series of underground storage tanks to handle rainwater, to store rainwater and let the, the drainage system kind of catch up. Mm-hmm. Uh, larger sewer systems and different things of that nature. So that work's being done, um, some big pipe solutions and, and things like that. But it's always a challenge, you know, how far do we go? What, uh, How rare an event of an event do we build for? Yeah, certainly that's the question. I imagine it, all these things come with a price tag as well. And so to, to, to adapt, to, you know, build in preparation for something that may or may not happen, uh, certainly there's there's costs to be weighed there as well. But it's it's certainly an interesting discussion, Glenn, and we appreciate you joining us on the program to break it down for us. Thank you. Glenn McGilvery is Managing Director of the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction. Tomorrow on the show, we will have a conversation about a neighbourhood that is particularly hard hit by flooding, including its ageing elevators. So stay tuned for that part of the conversation.